The stories that, that we tell and that we live in are fundamentally ways that we deal with the complexity of the world. And the fundamental problem with the world, as far as I can tell, is that not only is it complex beyond your comprehension, but the complexity shifts in unpredictable ways. So that's the Darwinian conundrum, actually. That's why Darwinism seems to be a practical necessity with regards to the continuation of life, because, because the complexity changes unpredictably, you can't necessarily tell what's going to work in the future. And so the Darwinian process solves that by generating quasi-random uh, variations and letting whichever one by happenstance happens to work in that environment survive. Now, it, it's not random, precisely, because the underlying structure is conserved. It's very rare that a child would be born with an extra arm or something like that. And like the skeletal structure that you inhabit is shared by animals going way, way back in evolutionary history. There's a lot of conservation in, in the evolutionary process. But, so there's variation within conservation. Like music, it's a, good, it's a good way of thinking about it. So the, the stories that we tell have exactly the same structure. They, they have this, this core element with variations. And so all right, I'll, I'll turn to the stories. And so the first problem, as I mentioned, is com a complexity problem. Things are just too complicated to get a handle on. And that actually has serious consequences because what happens to everyone eventually is that their lives become so complicated that they die. So, and, that, and, that, and many terrible things can happen to you on the way to dying as well that are complex, complexity related, right? You can develop a serious illness that you can't get a handle on. You can hit a, a what would you call, an impasse in your relationship that you cannot get past and see no way out of. That happens to people quite frequently. People who are suicidal, for example, they often feel like they've been backed into a corner, that, no, that they have no options. They have no good options. No matter which way they turn, there's something terrible to face, and they can't see any way out of it. And sometimes that's more true than you'd like to think, because we also tend to like to think that people's problems are primarily psychological, but they're not. And that, that's one thing you learn quite rapidly as a clinician, is that most of the time, people don't come to you because they have mental illness. They come to you because they have a complexity management problem. Their lives have got out of hand on them, and they don't know how to get them back under control. And so all sorts of things can do that. And then, of course, that can make you anxious or depressed. It can trigger all sorts of illnesses. But the fundamental problem is still that things have got beyond you. And that actually has a psychophysiological cost that isn't merely psychological. You have a limited amount of capacity from, from, from a resource perspective to deal with emergent complexity. You just, there's just not enough of you. you just, you'll, you'll exhaust your psychophysiological resources if you get into a situation that's too complex. Well, that's what, this, that's what the idea of chaos represents. It represents that underlying complexity that can manifest itself at any time. And it can manifest itself, for example, if you're if you wake up in the morning and you, know, you feel an ache of some sort, and perhaps it's nothing, and you ignore it, but it gets worse, and you end up going to the hospital, and you find out, perhaps, for example, that you have pancreatic cancer, and you're going to live for six months, and that's the end of that. And so it's, 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 it's at that moment that you break through the thin ice that everyone walks on, and you see what's underneath. And what's underneath is the ineradicable complexity of life, and that's chaos. And that's, now, it's taken people a long, long time to get a grip on this conceptual, what would you call it, conceptual schema. And, and human beings have done it mostly with image and story before they've been able to do it in any articulated manner. And so there are a set of images that represent this underlying chaos. And one of them is the dragon of chaos, that, that precisely that. And that's the dragon that the hero goes out to confront. That's the symbol of the unknown. It's the thing that lurks underneath. It's the thing that also guards treasure, because in the unknown, there's possibility. Also, the, the, the water that, that, that was there that we talked about in the Mesopotamian creation myth, the water that's there at the beginning, um, both the salt and the fresh water, is often a symbol of 
pre-cosmogonic chaos. Um, often people have dreams, for example. Some of you have had this dream, I suspect. You'll dream that you're in a house that you know well, and all of a sudden you discover a new room or a set of new rooms or maybe a set of rooms in the basement. And often the rooms are, are, are not well organized and they're full of water. Those are very common things. And what that means is that you've broken through the constraints of your conscious self-understanding to a new domain of, of possibility, but a new domain that needs a tremendous amount of work. It says, well, here's a new part of you, but it's not well developed. There's, there's, it's flooded. It's flooded with chaos, essentially. And it's water, I think, partly, because chaos is not only what you fall into when you're not expecting it, but it's also the unknown that you confront forthrightly and generate new things out of. And water is a symbol of life, especially in the desert. And of course, water life is dependent on water. And so water is a natural symbol to utilize when you're talking about something that's life-giving but also potentially deadly. Because a little bit of water, well, that's a drink, but a lot of water, that's a shipwreck, right? And so, and, and those, are the, those are the extremes. Now, there are accounts that are sort of subtexts in Genesis and elsewhere in the Old Testament of God conquering a great monster, Leviathan, or or uh, behemoth that has these sort of serpentile elements and making the world a, as a consequence of that conflict. So there's this idea that the world creating force, which we've talked about as the logos, is the thing that continually confronts chaos and that one way of thinking about chaos is as a predatory reptilian monster and often one that lives in the depths or perhaps underwater. And part of that, I think, is because we actually use our predator detection circuit to do this sort of precognitive processing. And so the, the notion fundamentally is anything that threatens you instantaneously is something that your predator detection circuit should be working with. It's fast. It's, it's, it's fast. It's low resolution. It doesn't have a lot of ideas, but it's really, really fast. And that also accounts for our capability and tendency to very rapidly treat people who upset our conceptual structures as enemies of the predatory variety. We can fall into that in no time flat, because it, it's, it's the archetype. If something comes along to knock you for a loop, it's a shark. It's something that lurks under the water. It's something that'll pull you down. It's an enemy. And, and you should get prepared. And that's a reasonable defensive strategy, even though it also has its dangers and can sometimes be wrong. So the landscape within which we have to erect our stories is fundamentally one of an overarching chaos, a chaos that exceeds our capacity to comprehend in, in any sense, individually, familial, socially, economically. We're always threatened by the collapse of the structures that we inhabit constantly. We have to work. Well, it's like you own a house. You know, How much time do you spend maintaining a house? Well, a lot. And why is that? It's because the house falls apart because you're stupid, and the house falls apart, well, because you do repairs wrong or you ignore things, right? And I'm saying this actually for technical reasons. The house falls apart because you're incompetent. But even if you're competent, the house falls apart, right? It's just entropy, and so things have a proclivity to fall apart on their own, so you just have to run like mad just to keep them doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then, of course, that is complicated by your own willful blindness and inadequacy as a repair person and refusal to attend and all those other things. So, so and that's a very classic idea, which we'll return to. One of the ideas that, that Mircea Eliade, a uh, fam famous historian of religions, extracted from a very large corpus of flood myths was the idea that the earth is periodically flooded for two reasons. One is things fall apart. Just entropy. It's straight entropy. It's, I don't remember which law of thermodynamics that is, but it's one of the big laws of thermodynamics. So it's, it's, it's one of the top three, man. Things fall apart of their own accord. And that's one of the things that we have to contend with. And then the rate at which things fall apart is sped by the sins of men. That's the other idea. And you know that. Everyone knows that because you know, you know, your car breaks down on the highway, and you think, God, that's so inconvenient. And then you, you, know, you shake your fist at the sky, and then there's part of you in the back of your mind that goes, God, you know, 
I knew that rattle that I wasn't paying attention to actually signified something, you know? And I, I knew I should have paid attention to it, and I didn't, and now I'm in the situation that I'm in now. And, you know, I know, I, I bet you this happens to people two or three times a week, is they do something stupid that they know they shouldn't have done that they told themselves not to do mere seconds before, and they know the voice says, don't do that, yeah, yeah, you do it. You can get nailed for it exactly the way that you knew you would get nailed for it. And then you're hurt doubly because not only did it fall apart, but you're the idiot that made it fall apart, knowing full well that it was going to fall apart and ignoring it. And so that's the idea behind the notion that there are two reasons that things fall apart. Thermodynamic entropy and the proclivity of people not to attend to things they know they should attend to. And partly we do that because... If, if a problem emerges, it always announces itself, unless it's a really, really tiny problem and you're approaching it voluntary, voluntarily, it always announces itself with negative emotion. And that's part of the predator detection circuit. It, it announces itself in frustration or disappointment or emotional pain or grief or the paramount one, anxiety. And, and no wonder, because it's a problem, right? And the logical, one of the logical responses is to sort of freeze in the face of the problem. But of course, if it's a problem that has to be addressed and solved, freezing it and turning away from it is not a good solution because since things tend to fall apart on their own accord, if you just leave the thing alone that's problematic, it's just going to get worse, not better, which is one of the things that's very annoying about life. So, for example, you know, if you get a warning message from the tax department, the probability that ignoring that will make it go away is zero, right? What will happen instead is that the more you ignore it, the larger it will grow. And if you ignore it long enough, then it will turn into something large enough to eat you. And that will be the end of you. And I read in Harper's Magazine at one point that people would rather be mugged than audited. And so <laughs> I believe that because the mugging, man, that's over, right? It's like a couple of minutes of sheer terror, loss of your wallet, the way you walk. The audit, that's like... That's like a semi-fatal disease. So, so that's chaos. Now, it's the idea here, too, is that that's the chaos. That's the psychological idea is that that's also the chaos that whatever is being represented in Genesis as the Spirit of God extracts order out of at the beginning of time. And it's also that which we're constantly contending with as we struggle in the same manner to construct and maintain habitable worlds. So it's brilliant. It's brilliant. You know, when I first put together the relationship between the, what Iliad called the pre-cosmogonic chaos and the predator, predatory landscape that surrounded our ancestors and the manner in which we're structured neurologically to respond to all of that, I thought it was, it was like an, a, an amazing epiphany because it's self-evidently the case that the world is too complicated for us to deal with. And that's one of the problems that we face on an ongoing basis. And then the question is, well, what do you do about that? And if you ignore it, it gets worse. So ignoring it doesn't work. And so we know what doesn't work. And so if ignoring it doesn't work, then attending to it might work. And then I found out with the Egyptians, for example, that Horus was the god of attention. And the same thing happened among the Mesopotamians with Marduk and his ring of eyes. It's like, what's the way to forestall the catastrophe of things falling apart. And the answer to that is by attending to them, voluntarily attending to them. And that slots very nicely into the hero mythology that promotes the idea that if there's a dragon in, in the whereabouts, in, 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 the near, in, the, in, in, the, in the neighborhood, let's say, that hiding in the basement just makes it grow larger. It's time to go out and confront the damn thing. And the general stories are is, well, you might get killed because it's a dragon, but it's only might as opposed to definitely will get killed if it happens to attack you at 3 in the morning at home when you're hungover and it's been a bad day and you don't have your, you know, our, your sword and your shield at the ready, which is generally what happens to people who avoid things. So it's not something that should be recommended. You're screwed both ways. That's one of the things that's so nice about being deeply pessimistic. It's so freeing because one of the things... <laughs> Well, it's very frequent. It's such a relief. And it's really a useful habit to develop is sometimes, no matter what you do, you're in trouble. And that's a relief because then you can stop scrabbling around for the way out. There's no way out, man. It's like you can pick murder. 
you know, wretched death A or slightly less wretched death B, something like that. But, and, and I know that's a terrible way of looking at things, but it is extraordinarily useful to understand that many times you get your choice boils down to picking the least bad option. And if that's all you can do, if that's what, how life is revealing itself to you, it's like, well, more power to you. The least bad option, that's the best you can do. And, and, and it's good enough, especially compared to the alternative, which is the most bad option. So 